Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of Latin America and the Caribbean. We broadcast every Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, 4.30 p.m. Pacific on Code Pink YouTube. Sunday, April 11th, we'll see Peruvians and Ecuadorians go to the polls to elect respective presidents for their countries. Peru's first round elections are Sunday, Ecuador's second round uh, elections are on Sunday and more to talk about that in another broadcast as Code Pink will have um, an election observation mission in Ecuador starting uh, tonight, actually. Um, so regarding Peru and their first round presidential elections, which also will include um, congressional elections, um, we are joined today by Francesca Emanuel to discuss the elections this Sunday in Peru. And let me tell you a little bit about her before we start our conversation. Francesca is a Peruvian sociologist, born and raised in the province of Ica, four hours from Lima. She is currently a research assistant at American University in Washington, DC, where she is pursuing doctoral studies in anthropology. For the past 15 years, her op-eds and articles have been published in numerous Peruvian newspapers. She is currently a regular columnist for the progressive Peruvian publication, Huayica. Prior to academia, Francesca was the correspondent for Telesur in Washington, DC, and a communications director for the Peru-based nonprofit, Promsex, which advocates for LGTBI rights and women's reproductive rights. Her most recent piece in English on the, is on the coup in Bolivia and was published by the magazine Red Pepper. Welcome, Francesca. I'm so glad you had time to, to uh, talk with us today. Thank you, Terry. So I'm um, talking with you from Nicaragua, which this is not a virtual background. This is literally what Nicaragua looks like this time of day and this time of year. And you are joining us from Washington, DC. And I'm, I'm so pleased you have time for um, a conversation. I think for our audience, why, uh, why don't you start us off with the current political context in Peru? We in the United States are not hearing a whole lot about the upcoming presidential elections. I think most of us understand there's been corruption charges and an impeachment against the prior president. There's an interim president. And for those of you um, watching, 18 presidential candidates for Sunday. So let's talk a little bit about this mix of candidates and the political context that has created uh, this slate for Sunday. Yeah, um, first, this is a very important electoral battle and it's very important for Peruvians, at least for the uh, next five years, but it's really important for the whole region. Um, on, on April 11, as you said, um, in Peru, we're gonna have um, uh, presidential uh, uh, elections and elections for Congress too. And there are 18 candidates um, that are running for presidential, uh, for, the, for the presidency. Among those 18 candidates, there's a statistical tie uh, between six candidates. Uh, according, according to the polls, that's a lot. That means that most of these, I mean, all of these ca ca six candidates have, uh, top, they have chances to reach the runoff. And uh, five of these six candidates are right-wing or extremely right-wing. There is only one of six of these six candidates that is a progressive leftist candidate and her name is Veronica Mendoza, uh, and she runs with the party uh, together for Peru. Um, you were asking about the context. So last November, we had what we call a parliamentary coup. Uh, um, our president, Martin Vizcarra, was uh, uh, kicked out from uh, a decision in Congress, 
And then there was a de facto president for a few days. And after several demonstrations against this move and against this illegal move, uh, uh, people would say in Peru, uh, this president resigned, this de facto president resigned. But uh, in, in this process, there were massive demonstrations and these people were brutally repressed by this de facto president and the military forces. Two people died uh, from this repression, two young men and thousands of people were injured. Along with, with, uh, with these demonstrations against this coup, there were other demonstrations in different parts of the country uh, against the, 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 po the neoliberal policies that have been taking place. Uh, so this is pretty much the context uh, that is leading us to these new elections. And of course, people in Peru uh, are sick of uh, candidates who are deeply uh, corrupt. And, and most of the candidates that are running this time have accusations, many of them uh, already in the courts against them for cor corruption, for uh, uh, irregularities in, in, in uh, financing their campaigns and so on. And one of the, uh, well, two things that I'm thinking of now <laughs> with your comments, um, the legislative coup against President Vizcarra was basically, uh, he was impeached on corruption charges, correct? That, that's correct. Nevertheless, was, what, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I said, like, no, I mean, we're, I think we're all familiar with what we call today soft coups, legislative, judicial, economic, various forms of um, coups short of flat out military um, change in power. And, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, 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 you finish it I have a slight delay with my Wi-Fi, I'm sorry. Um, and you also mentioned that a number of the candidates, if not all of them, have some form of corruption hanging over them. Uh, for instance, um, Kiko Fujimori, she's under house arrest. She's the former president's daughter and is currently running as a presidential candidate, un candidate under house arrest. I mean, yeah, that's, it's, that's yeah, crazy no, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's, uh, if you want, I can go over the those like five right wing candidates, so we can like uh, look. That'd be great. <laughs> that would be, that'd be terrific. Yeah. So, um, so there are three candidates of those five that are um, directly connected with uh, Alberto Fujimori, as uh, as you said. He is uh, uh, our former dictator in Peru, uh, and, and he is serving 25 years in prison. Uh, among the crimes he committed, uh, he sent paramilitary groups to kill thousands of indigenous. Also, uh, there were like 270,000 uh, women, indigenous women who were forcibly uh, sterilized sterilized during his presidency. So as you said, his daughter, uh, Keiko Fujimori is running in this uh, in these elections. Uh, it's her third time running. Uh, she reached the runoff in the past elections in 2016. As you said, also, she is uh, serving uh, provisional imprisonment. I don't know if you call it that way because uh, um, her party was financed illegally by uh, real estate Brazilian uh, construction well, company called Odebrecht. Uh, oh, so, that, yeah, 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 that yeah, that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So she's offering a tough hand. She's also one of her policies is to pardon her uh, her father. Um, and, and yeah, she's running even though she's under investigation. Then you have another candidate, uh, his name is Rafael Lopez Aliaga. He represents the, the, the extreme right wing, he, akin to uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Trump in the US, that this is a very uh, dangerous candidate. Uh, he's part of the Opus Dei and he's a multimillionaire. Uh, 
Alberto Fujimori, the, our, our, dicta our recent dictator, um, uh, gave him the, the, uh, the concession, I don't know if you call it that way, but he permit this uh, Rafael Lopez Aliaga, this candidate, to have the monopoly of trains that take uh, tourists from Cusco to Machu Picchu for almost 10 years. Um, and, and this uh, Rafael Lopez Aliaga it has uh, many members of the uh, Fujimori party in his new party. So he's extremely connected to uh, Alberto Fujimori, to, to his whole legacy and ideology. Uh, as I said, he's part of the Opus Dei. He's against any uh, rights that protects LGBTIQ rights. He has said that if uh, of course, he's against abortion, and he has said that if a girl, uh, and sorry for your audience, uh, if, if a girl um, gets pregnant uh, because she was raped, he would put those girls in one of his five stars hotels because he's also uh, the owner mm -hmm. of, of a chain of hotels. And, and these girls would stay there until they give birth, and then they would decide if uh, they will give the baby to the state for adoption or if they will keep the baby. So those are the type of statements that this candidate wow. uh, says. And, and, and then, uh, well, he has, um, he, he has an investigation because he hasn't paid in uh, $28 million in taxes, despite he is a multimillionaire. And this that's was, why he's a multimillionaire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and this was discovered recently because of this campaign. And there we, ha we have another candidate that is also very connect, uh, presidential candidate that is also very connected to the Fujimori group. Uh, his name is Hernando de Soto. And in the past few days, he has become the candidate of the economic groups in Peru. So, uh, so now they, uh, the, the major media in Peru are interviewing him, are putting him on display uh, in order to like gain his support or help him uh, to reach the second round. Um, he is a neoliberal uh, economist who was uh, an advisor of Alberto Fujimori uh, during his presidency. And he was also an advisor of Keiko Fujimori when she was running in the previous election. Uh, he supports the, the neoliberal policies. He thinks, for example, he said yesterday that uh, uh, if he, if he uh, wins, he will make the public, the private sector, the main responsible or the only responsible to import uh, COVID-19 vaccines uh, because the, the private sector, according to him, is much more efficient than, than the state. So those are, so if, if you want to make it. Wow, comment. okay, so yeah, my first comment is it seems like the Fujimori uh, political sector uh, has, in one way or another, numerous, several candidates. Um, basically, they're kind of covering their butts to see, you know, they could win from several different um, positions or from several different candidates. Uh, wow. <laughs> I like, yeah. I, you know, I, as I've been following and researching what's coming on in Peru on Sunday, you know, it doesn't sound good, but listening to you, it's like really almost impossible to believe. So I guess my first, there's two things I'd like you to elaborate on. One, the leftist candidate, because uh, you mentioned before we went live that you've worked on a letter uh, mm -hmm. for her, with her, uh, that our audience should hear about. But also with 18 candidates, with the public perceiving all of them pretty much, or at least 17 of the 18 of them uh, corrupt, from various degrees of corruption. The lead candidate, I think what I read yesterday, uh, Lescano yeah. has just over 12% of support in the polls. So how does any, and then, um, so I guess pretty much we're, the Peruvian people are guaranteed on Sunday 
there will be no first round winner because the, you have to win 50% or more. So with 18 candidates, that's not possible for anyone to do. After Sunday, you take the top two and that goes to uh, a head to head election, a second round election on June 6, I believe. So how do you see this playing out? Because as I'm looking at this and listening to you as well, it doesn't sound like any one candidate has plurality, that whatever happens on Sunday, no one candidate is gonna have political capital. How do you see the country being led and managed come June 6? Well, it, it of course will depends on who wins. Um, uh, if I follow your your questions, and I understand the confusion because it's even yes. it's super <laughs> confusing even for us. I mean, there are other two candidates among those six, and one of them, uh, as you mentioned, the leading candidate. Let's say that 12 twelve percent of support is is really nothing. There are there's around like 28% of the population, of the electoral population in Peru who is undecided still. Yeah, um, that, so that's probably the biggest, the biggest demographic that can influence the outcome on Sunday. Yeah, definitely. So these next days are crucial uh, uh, for the decision that this 28% uh, of the population will make. So this candidate you, that you were talking about, he is a member of Acción Popular, uh, Popular Action, uh, uh, that was the leading party in the parliamentary coup, le legislative coup that we were talking about. So. Uh, the president, the de facto president that we had in November, it's part of this party uh, uh, that uh, uh, that is leading the presidential uh, polls, let's say, uh, and and it's kind of like a schizophrenic because uh, there were massive demonstrations against this party, and this party acted in a horrible way. Uh, repressing people, as I told you, two, two young men uh, died as a result. Uh, but this candidate, they found a candidate that has been a member of Congress for 20 years, and he was uh, one of the leading voices against monopolies in Peru. Nevertheless, he never did anything to stop monopolies. In Peru, there are several, several monopolies. Um, as a result of the uh, decades of neoliberal policies starting uh, basically with Alberto Fujimori, for example, 78% of the printed media belongs to one company. Uh, 98, I think, uh, percent of the a beer of beer that is is consumed and produced in Peru belongs to one company, and I can give you a whole list. There's wow. a there's like monopolies in 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 pharmacies, in in drugstores, and so on. So this guy was one of the leading voices against these uh, monopolies um, uh, because he was part of a committee in Congress for 20 years that was supposed to protect uh, uh, consumers. And he was talking against this, this, this corporations and so on, but he never did anything. So they pick him uh, to lead the to lead the, the their party to to run for presidential election because you know he is well known. Um, but uh, he also uh, belongs to a party that supports neoliberal policies too. Um, and there's another candidate um, who was a former um, a, a soccer player uh, who has almost no uh, experience in, in politics, who is running and, and he was uh, supporter, supported by the uh, economic groups, but since, since he hasn't been a very good speaker in debates, uh, that support has been like channeling to all to the other candidates that I told you about. And also this candidate, this soccer, uh, former soccer player have members of the Fujimori party in his party. So it's like all yeah. over the place. It's like they a, have all like, their bases covered, those people. Yeah, um, uh, yeah wow. and as they said, uh, Veronica Mendoza is uh, the leftist progressive um, candidate. Uh, she's running with a very austere uh, campaign she she is not supported by the corporation 
tell me. I was going to say, us, just for our audience, austere meaning she is not, um, she doesn't have a lot of funding versus an austerity vision for the country and the economy. <laughs> just austere, meaning her campaign is very. Oh, yes. Thin. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. That's okay. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's great that you mentioned because, in fact, her economic. She's not an austerity supporter as no. far as economics. Yeah. In fact, <laughs> the, in fact the, the opposite. Yeah. She is yeah. uh, proposing uh, contra cyclical policies uh, that means like investing, increasing. Uh, uh, the investment in in the public sector from the public sector, right? Um, uh, and it's something that she has been attacked for because, according to these other candidates, uh, the state or or the public sector shouldn't spend more. Uh, it's the private sector that will save the Peru Peruvians from the huge economic crisis that. We, we are in. So in the past year, there has been an, a, an increase by 27% in poverty. Uh, our our uh, unemployment has more than doubled in the past year. Uh, we have, it's sad because Peru has been portrayed as like a paradigm for Latin America, as this country that has been growing steadily by the IMF, by the World Bank. We were like this wonderful example, very uh, a very close ally to the U.S. in the region. But uh, since the pandemic started, we've been seeing that that growth never spread out, never reached the, the, the working class population. We are, we are uh, the worst country in terms of deaths from COVID in the world. <laughs> the Financial Times published uh, uh, some data yesterday for uh, of excess deaths from COVID and we are on top per capita. Wow. It's, it's really wow. sad. And, and at the same time, we had the worst lockdown in the whole world. Our people have been in their houses, forced to be in their houses for over a year with, uh, uh, um, with the military on the streets, uh, forcing people to, to uh, not leave their house, not even for emergencies, with uh, curfews uh, that were enforced. And this has been happening for the past year. Nevertheless, we have all these deaths. Um, and it's, it's extremely sad. Um, the private sector has been uh, uh, controlling oxygen, medicinal mm. oxy oxygen, and uh, working class people weren't able to buy this oxygen that now went up and it cost like $3,000 per like gallon or something. And, and for example, one of the proposals of this uh, progressive candidate, Veronica Mendoza, is that the state has to control for, for a little while the, the production and distribution of, of oxygen so it's not a business anymore. And all these candidates, even the media, is like attacking her for this measure that is like a measure with a public health perspective. So, so yeah, this is, this is the sad situation. It's um, just to digress a, you know, a bit, it's been really fascinating and devastating and sad at the same time to watch the past year. It's been a little over a year now, March, 2020, with the pandemic and watching those nations with pretty much privatized economies, specifically with healthcare versus those nations with at least a combination of nationalized healthcare and private or fully nationalized, the responses have been so completely different. And the success stories have been, it's just been so obvious when there is national healthcare, state healthcare, and everyone has access at least to fundamental care. The survival rate is completely different versus in privatized systems. And I, I mean, and the lockdown, keeping people uh, physically and emotionally uh, imprisoned in their homes has not been healthy either. And um, so I'm happy that you're sharing, or have, I shouldn't say it's not happy, but I think it's really um, important to hear of these problems in Peru with 
privatized healthcare. So let's talk a little bit more about Veronica the Mendoza, the leftist candidate, because um, you were explaining to me before we went live, um, you've been involved in uh, a letter. Um, and let's talk about that a bit. Yeah, so as I told you before, the main attack against Veronica Mendoza, uh, who actually is a former Congresswoman, uh, she was a Congresswoman for five years, uh, five years ago, and she ran with uh, Ojanto Mala, who was her president. And after one year, this Ojanto Mala president uh, ran with a platform, a leftist platform. And as soon as he won the presidency, his he, his leftist, leftist platform was gone and he has started supporting extractivism and mining projects and so on. So Veronica Mendoza resigned from the, from the party uh, uh, after one year uh, in, in, as, as a Congresswoman, precisely because there, was a, there, there were like several uh, demonstrations and protests in indigenous communities against a mining project. So uh, since then, she has been well known in, in the country. And now it's her second time running as, as president. Uh, in, in 2016, she, she, she ran uh, and, and she almost reached the, the runoff. Uh, but uh, but Keiko Fujimori got some like percent more, and so Keiko Fujimori uh, uh, went to the runoff instead of her. Um, so now her her platform is still a leftist platform that wants to diversify the economy, that wants to go over the the contracts, the the bilateral also agreements that uh, Peru had um, with the US, for example, or with other, uh, or with a contract with mining uh, that are actually damaging uh, not only communities, but also all our environment in Peru. And, and, and of course, like a big uh, proposal of increasing public investment, but her main attack or the main attack that, that the major media is using against her is that first, her proposal is not viable. Her proposal is like a leftist uh, mm -hmm. that will bring Peru to poverty. Actually, they are saying that will make Peru another Venezuela. One of the, the big attacks against her, against her because she's a leftist is that she will make Peru another Venezuela. In fact, a few days ago, uh, one of the major newspaper, newspapers had in their front page, the, the picture of uh, President Nicolás Maduro and saying, we were with Chavez, Chavistas, uh, Veronica Mendoza, or we were with Chavismo, Veronica Mendoza, just because she said that she doesn't recognize, recognize Guaidó and that she <laughs> will try to uh, find other ways and not the Grupo de Lima to have negotiations and conversations with uh, between uh, the, uh, the government of President Nicolás Maduro and the opposition. But just because she said that, which is something that everybody knows that Guaidó is not the president of Venezuela, she has been like uh, attacked again, saying that, that she will make Peru another Venezuela. So coming back to the, to the letter, this letter was written by, by economists and academics here in the US uh, explaining that uh, her economic program is, is solid, that it's not a crazy economic program and actually is aligned with other countries like the US, uh, countries in Europe are doing to revitalize, to, to, to uh, to make the con to make the economy recover, uh, and and yeah, in Peru, I don't know why the major media is uh, not taking that as a, as as the uh, as their regular way to go in an economic crisis, contracyclical measures. Okay. Um, and and this this letter was published today in two major media outlets in in Peru. And let's see uh, how the trolls are gonna react because, <laughs> <laughs> because probably the attack. 
it's fascinating to hear, oh, she's going to make uh, Peru another Venezuela. Do you, when, when you hear that in the media, that rhetoric, you know, for me, I don't know about you, but for me, it's like, well, does that mean they in, intend to support sanctions on the country as a, you know, as a form to, as a form of warfare to squeeze the public into, or at this point it would be a threat, you know, um, as to how to vote on, on Sunday, you know? Yeah, I mean, I mean <laughs> no, there is like a, a huge disinformation campaign, fake news going around all the media, major media, supposedly serious media. I mean, they had never talk about the sanctions in Venezuela, yeah. but uh, there's another like disinformation campaign debate in, in the major media about importing, uh, about importing vaccines. In Peru, I mean, most of the people probably now think that uh, they, we don't have enough vaccines because the, the, the public sector has been incompetent in, in having contracts to import those vaccines. I mean, they are not talking about the scarcity and the inequalities, global inequalities right. that uh, exist. And we are part of those uh, developing countries that are not gaining uh, receiving vaccines because because we're not the US, because we are not Europe. But that debate doesn't exist. According to all candidates and media, uh, everything would be solved if we, if we let the private sector to have negotiations with the pharmaceuticals and import those vaccines. Well, we know that doesn't work. And we can just look at the example in the United States to show how lack of access to affordable healthcare, much less state healthcare, allowed so many people to die. So in the, in, I wonder if we could take the last few minutes, Francesca, I'm so pleased that you, you have had time today for this conversation, really important conversation that doesn't, um, hasn't been a lot of focus on the Peruvian elections in the United States. Um, let's talk about the different possible scenarios with the elections, and I guess we should probably look at Sunday and then beyond to June 6th, what are the regional ramifications of, of the Peruvian elections? If they, if they go right, if they go left, or how do you see the, the results of the election affecting the region? Well, I mean, if, if, if Peru goes left, it will be a huge, uh, uh, shake of the geopolitical landscape in our region. Uh, uh, Peru, as I said before, has been uh, for decades uh, one of the strongest allies to the US. So this is major and this is very crucial. And I'm really uh, shocked of why it hasn't, uh, international media has been paying enough attention in these elections, probably because they are super confusing as we've been. Yeah, they really are. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. They are. And, it, and, and if, it, it goes, if it goes right, it's, it's horrible for people in Peru. Already uh, the right-wing candidates that I'm, I mentioned have said that they would uh, go over of those mining projects that were not approved because they had Serial, uh, serious flaws because they 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 were gonna contaminate uh, indigenous populations and so on. And they said that under this economic crisis, they had to check those uh, um, projects and probably approve them right away because it's, uh, more money is needed, more foreign investment is needed. Well. Um, Veronica's proposal is completely different. Uh, and it, it would make a huge, huge change, uh, not only in the, in the geopolitical situation in our region, because we, we will have another president from the left. And, and this, is, this is something that hasn't happened in my lifetime. Uh, <laughs> so I'm very excited if that happens. If it doesn't happen, at least uh, it would happen like in, in the US, right? It's like she has been putting on the agenda very important mm -hmm. policies. Yes. Exactly. 
and like like Bernie Sanders did uh, mm -hmm. when he was running and afterwards. So so uh, this is she's getting a narrative out there. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Exactly. But I just, really really hope that that she reaches the the runoff. She has been uh, voted as the best uh, debater in all the de presidential debates. <clears throat> she's clearly the most prepared uh, candidate. And she has, and she has a strong team of academic economy, all people from the left, and very uh, and, and and very well educated people who who are from like indigenous communities too, people from LGBT, LGBTIQ uh, groups, uh, and 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 it's a solid solid program that will help to to take away the neoliberal decades that have been putting us like in this hole that we are right now and we can see now with the with the deaths and the crisis uh, from this pandemic. So Francesca, I hope that you will come back and talk with us next week and maybe deconstruct um, the results from Sunday and we can um, talk about what the possibilities are for June 6th. It would be a, a wonderful post um, first round election conversation. So I'm going to throw that out to you. No, sure, audience. sure. <laughs> I would like to give you more certainty. But as I said before, there there is still 28% of the population who is still undecided. And there are so many candidates. Uh, um, uh, but I, I'm, I'm hopeful that that um, that that she will reach the the runoff for for our people. Uh, yeah. She is proposing also a new constitution. She wants to protect rights of Afro-Peruvian people, indigenous people. She is proposing a whole perspective of el buen vivir, uh, something that that hasn't happened before, and will it will like uh, uh, help not only Peru, as I said, the whole region. Yeah, yeah, it's a. Uh... The possibilities are pretty exciting, actually. Yeah. So let's have you come back and we'll deconstruct Sunday the 11th. Um, and I just want to remind our audience that um, you've been watching What the F is Going On in Latin America. This is Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of Latin America and the Caribbean. We broadcast every Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, 4.30 p.m. Pacific. And also be sure uh, to listen to Code Pink Radio every Thursday, 11 a.m. Eastern uh, on uh, WBAI out of Washington, uh, New York City, excuse me, and WPFW out of Washington, D.C., the program simulcasts on both, both stations on Thursday mornings. And again, thank you so much, Francesca. And I wonder if um, you could send me the link for, the, uh, for this letter for uh, Veronica Mendoza, and I will post it um, for our viewers. I'll post it um, in the program notes so that they can take a look at that. Sure. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.